today we are going to talk about suffering. Why suffering? Because suffering is one of the main uh, things that every Christian should face if he or she is a good Christian. Because there is a big uh, truth that when we become Christians, we start a warfare with an unseen enemy. And when that unseen enemy learns for the first time that you have given your life to Jesus, he will start then and there to oppose you. Because where, before you give your heart to Jesus, you could have been anybody of any faith. You could have been a good person according to the worldly terms. Or you could be a the, ni the, the nicest person in town. But you have belonged to the devil. Either you belong to God or you belong to the devil. So, before you become a Christian, you, you were owned by the devil. And what happened is that he lost that ownership. The devil, Satan, lost the ownership and the authority that he had in your life. And that's when he starts to oppose you. And at that very moment of you becoming a Christian, a great warfare begins. But don't take that as a sad news, friends. Because we belong to Jesus who started Christianity with suffering. It's because he suffered we received salvation. It's because he received the stripes on his body that we received healing. So, because of the sufferings of Jesus, we have received the eternal life. So, Christianity was started subsequent to a great suffering that the Lord went through when he came to this earth. To the extent where he was in the garden of Gethsemane and he, he was so anguished and he was in so much pain that his blood vessels began to crack and he began to sweat blood. That was how Jesus started to bleed even before going to the cross. So he is our master, he is our Lord and we, we follow Jesus and just like Jesus we are heirs in the kingdom of God. So, suffering has to play a very important role in everybody's Christian life. Talking about me, my suffering in Christianity began almost as soon as I became a Christian. Coming from a very ardent, staunch, high Hindu family, I was the priest of the house. I had to offer the, the, the priestly mantras and pujas every day in the morning and evening, 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. And I, I was told about Jesus but, and I did not like it because I was told to hate Jesus and hate white man. That was I was taught. As you can see, I am a brown man from Sri Lanka and I was taught to hate the white man and white man's God. The Hindus had 330 million gods. So why another God? I was very unhappy about the gospel of Christ when it was preached to me, but I was in a situation where I couldn't uh, do anything. I was only 11 years old. If I were, say, 21, I would have gotten up and killed that pastor who preached the gospel to me. I was 11, too young to do that. But not too young to oppose Christianity. Not too young to express the ardent faith that I had in my religion. But one thing of all what he said, one thing struck deep in my heart. And it stays to this day. That was about the death of Jesus Christ. Well, we all believe that Jesus rose again from the dead. But at that time, 
The resurrection did not mean anything to me. But the death of Jesus meant a lot. Because I was worshipping 330 million gods and they didn't do any good to any, any, any human, any follower. They demanded so many things from the, from the believers, but the gods did not do anything to those believers. And here comes a Christian who talks about only one God that he worships and he says that this one God became a man and he died for us. How did he die? Not by taking sleeping tablets, but being going through a huge scene of suffering. The lashes that he got, the spit that he, that he had to experience. The thorny crown that he had to wear on his head and the crucifixion. I thought, could, could any God do that? The answer is no. No God could do that because the gods that I had known did not even love us to the extent of coming as a human being, let alone experiencing that kind of pain. But praise God for Jesus, the only God. He became man and he suffered for me. So the message of suffering, the message of the death of Christ, struck deep within my system. And I began to think, who is this Jesus? And I ended up believing him as my Lord and Savior. I gave my heart to Jesus. But not having seen a Bible, let alone reading it. Not having seen a church, let alone going into it. Not having any conversation with any Christian, except for that pastor who came and preached the gospel. I didn't know anything about Christianity. So I went back to my home and I got involved in the priestly duties. But in my heart I was praying to this Jesus the way I knew. I said, Jesus, you know what? I'm not worshipping these gods, I'm worshipping you, right? So please accept these mantras for yourself. But uh, that, I didn't know any theology at that time. And God knew that I needed something. What's that? Power. Now I have the joy of salvation. I have salvation. I have Jesus. But something lacked in my life and that was power. Power for what? Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, but when, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you shall receive power. What's that power for? To be God's witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and to the utmost parts of the earth. So I needed a power to stand up for my faith. So one week went by and I, I, I went to that uh, place where I got saved. And uh, funnily enough, there was a fasting and prayer meeting on that Saturday. And I was invited to come to church. The Christian temple, as it were, at that time for me. So when I went there, I saw the people were ready for uh, prayer. And I went to the front and the pastor told me to kneel down, just like everybody else did. And, and uh, we began to pray. I didn't know how to pray. All I knew was to chant mantras to Hindu gods. So I was just trying to see what the others were doing and trying to copy. And I heard uh, these people say, thank you, Jesus, and hallelujah, and praise the Lord. So I began to uh, copy uh, those things, and I began to uh, say the same things, when my tongue began to twist and turn and began to disobey me. I wanted to say hallelujah, but my tongue wanted to say something else, which I didn't understand. I wanted to say praise the Lord, but the tongue was saying something else. So when I opened my mouth uh, uh, saying praise the Lord, it was saying something else. So I kept quiet. What's happening to me? I felt a fire go into me from the head to my toe. And I felt I was sweating like nothing. And, and, I, and, and I had never ever felt such an experience before. I got, I, I got confused, although I was not scared. And the pastor who, who, who had preached the gospel to me a week earlier, saw what was going on and he came to me and said, Son, don't worry, you have been given a gift. Just speak it up. When I spoke to him, I could speak. 
And I told him, what am I supposed to speak when I can't speak anything? Something else is happening. I am shouting gibberish. He said, no, that's a gift. You speak. You see, I, I had spoken in tongues. Long before I knew that speaking in tongues exists. Now that is why I am a very ardent believer of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. Because I spoke in tongues long before I ever saw anybody speak in tongues. Long before I ever heard that such a thing existed. Long before I knew or seen or turned a page in the Bible. I didn't know that that the Lord is a trinity and his Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. I didn't know any of those. I didn't know any theology. All I knew was Jesus died for me. That's it. So I began to speak in tongues. And then the pastor told me, go and lay, lay your hands on those people who are just seated and praying uh, without any power. I didn't know what it is to lay my hands on people. I had never done that. But when the pastor told me to do that, I thought, okay, I'll go and just do that. And when I went and laid my hands on those people, they also began to scream, yell, shout, and speak in tongues. Even before I received water baptism, even before I ever went and sat in a church service, even before I sang the first Christian chorus, even before seeing the Bible, God baptized me with the Holy Spirit and He used me in the ministry. And I can see why, because God has used me for the past 31 years for His glory. Because this happened in 1979 and this is 2010. And I have been a full-time pastor for the past 24 years. And for over 17 years I am going all around the world used by God just as He has promised in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. I returned home and I now had power. Power to be a witness. So my Christian walk has barely begun. Still haven't seen a Bible, still haven't flipped a page in the Bible, but with the power that the Holy Spirit had given me, I went home and I said, I am not worshipping any God but Jesus. I am not going to offer any pujas, I am not going to chant any mantras, I am not going to worship anything besides Jesus. And I was persecuted by my own mother. Here is my first Christian week. Here is the first few days into my Christianity. Having enjoyed the speaking of in tongues and receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, one would expect Christianity to be a bed of flowers. But for me, just as so many people in the Bible, my Christian walk began with suffering. My mother began to persecute me. And I would like to explain the way I was persecuted when I was only 11 years old. You know, some Christians, I don't understand why when Christians face some suffering, they nearly backslide. As if Jesus has told, hey, you come behind me, I'll give you bananas and uh, uh, french fries. Jesus never said that. You bear the cross if you follow me. So, many people get so upset when they go through suffering. But in this world, salvation comes as a package in which suffering is also a great part. And I began to suffer at the age of 11, a few days into my Christian walk, not knowing any theology, not even knowing that something called suffering exists. My mother just let me wear a pair of shorts, no shirt, nothing, beat me with a firewood to bleed me from my head to my toe. I was, the firewood attacked my face and I don't know how many bones broke, I don't know how many veins cracked, but I was bleeding from up to bottom. And when that ever Every strike was aimed at me. I was told, denounce Jesus. 
That's exactly what the devil wants. Denounce Jesus. Say that Jesus is not God. Say that Jesus is not the Lord. It is easy to say Jesus is the Lord, but it's difficult to say Jesus is my Lord. So the devil wanted to make me say Jesus is not my Lord. And I was beaten and then dragged and I was tied onto a tree. And that tree, a jack tree, it had hundreds of yellow ant nests. In countries like Sri Lanka and in India, you get these huge trees and these yellow ants, they are big. They are, they are bigger than the fire ants. They are not poisonous, but when millions of them sting you, whew, it's horrendous. And I was tied, and these ant nests were broken. Hundreds of ant nests were broken, and millions of ants were descending from the tree, and they went past my body, and they, having their homes destroyed, were angry already. And here is this stinking, bloody body of an 11-year-old, and these ants were just enjoying the feast when they went down to the floor. And I felt like, uh, I can't explain the pain. It was not a pain, it was a burning sensation, but it was too much to bear. I fainted. And I woke up when water was sprinkled on my face. I found myself in the front uh, yard of the house. And when I woke up, I saw my mother's face and her mouth moved. What was she saying? Denounce Jesus. You see, as an 11 year old boy from Asia, if there is anything, you have to run to your mom for refuge. And if your mom is your killer, who can you run to? And I was going through this suffering just a few days into my Christianity, not even knowing anything beyond that Jesus died and rose again. I said, no, this Jesus is real. And I was beaten again and I was dragged to a set second tree and the same ritual followed. Again millions of ants stung me and I could see my body was turning blue. Although the ants are not poisonous, their sting in millions were making my body go blue and I fainted. And when I woke up, I was very feeble and I knew that if this happened again, I would never wake up. But my mother was very, very particular in me, wanting to make me to de denounce Jesus. And when she said, denounce Jesus, I nodded my head. No, because I barely could talk. I was dragged to the third tree. And just before the breaking of the ant nests happened, I, I prayed. I didn't know how to pray, but I just said. I said, Jesus, I'm, I'm ready to come to you. But if by some miracle you let me live, I will become like that pastor who preached the gospel to me. I will be a pastor. And the Lord did something very miraculous. A relative of mine came and he saw this and he told my mother, don't just kill him. You have to kill your daughter also who has become a Christian in another town. So my mother untied me and said, I'll let you live till Sunday because I want you to take me to the church which brainwashed you. So I was let to live till Sunday. I was not taken into the house. I drank the water from the drain and I stole the food from my, from my dogs and I ate for one week. And on Sunday, I was a little better physically. We went to that church. And when the service was about to begin, when my mother and I entered, somebody broke out with a prophecy and said, the lady who is coming into this church, wait, Jesus has a word for you. And he prophesied and I saw my mother slain in the spirit, face forward. She was on the floor. 
right at the entrance of the church. She lay there sobbing till the service finished. For the next two hours she was crying and I was dumb stuck. I didn't know what to do. I was standing there. And after the service, she was carried to the pastor's office. Having spent one hour there with the pastor, she came out as a Christian. Friends, my first few days of Christianity was one of immense suffering. But I'll tell you something. If you want to build a building, you have to first dig the foundation. And when you dig, it's painful. It's pain. I know that the, the land does not have feelings. But imagine an operation. When the, when the surgeon's knife touches your body, it's painful. That's why they give us anesthetics. So, if, if we are a, a, a building that God wants to build, the first thing He wants to do is to dig a foundation. And in my life, the foundation was so gruesome, deep, hard to bear. Do you know why? Because God wanted a strong, big building. The deeper the foundation, better the building. The deeper the foundation and strong the foundation, stealthy stealthier the building. If you just want a simple flow, you have a very small foundation. Many Christians today in the 21st century want great things to do for God. They want to be used by God. They want to perform miracles. They want to see the, the world change and everything. But they don't like suffering. They don't want foundations. But they want to have big buildings. How can you have big buildings without foundations? So if Christians are going through sufferings, praise the Lord, the building is going to be very strong. Every one of the 11 disciples Jesus had, I'm not counting Judas Iscariot, the 11 disciples died as martyrs. They died through suffering. Even before they died, they went through immense suffering. You look at the Bible, how Paul and Silas were in the prison, but they were singing songs. And you look at Peter in the jail, and the chains opened, and, 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 and the things were so wonderful. And the people threatened them, saying, don't preach the gospel. And Peter says, are we to obey you, or are we to obey God? Suffering was the base on which... Christian church has been built. So suffering is good. I would like to read a verse from 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. Chapter 2, 1 Peter verse 11. And uh, Lindsay is going to read for us. Yes, 1 Peter 2 and 11. You like me? <coughs> Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Okay. Fleshly lusts. I want to explain what flesh is. Flesh is not the meat. It's not the meat. It's not, it's not this. Man is a spirit, he has a soul, and he has body. Now, the soul and body working together is flesh. So when one becomes a Christian, the spirit is revived. The spirit is born. You become a son of God. You become a huyos. You become a like Jesus, you are born into God's family. Old things are passed away, everything has become new. But our soul is still there and we are in this body. So what happens is the soul and the body get together and they try to fight with the spirit. So when the spirit fights against these two, 
It's two against one. So always the flesh seems to have the upper hand. That's why Paul says in Romans, I find this battle going on in me. My, I do what I don't want to do. And I don't do what I want to do. The spirit is willing. But the flesh is always opposing it. So this is told by Paul the Apostle. And that's exactly what's happening when we become Christians. The moment our spirit becomes alive by being born again into God's family, the soul and the body team up and they start the war with the spirit. And this spiritual warfare is used by the devil to bring man to the world. You know, our one of our enemies is the world. Worldly desire. Look, I am a Sri Lankan, but right now I am in Wales. Earthly, in earthly standards, I am a Sri Lankan visiting here in UK on a visa. When the visa expires, I have to be out of this country. Just like that, we belong to heaven. We are people who belong to God. We are sons of God. And I want to tell you, there are no daughters to God. Okay? There are no daughters to God. You know, people who like to uh, console the, the ladies, they say, uh, God's sons or daughters. No, I'll tell you, if you are a lady, and if you are upset to call yourself a son of God, I, as a man with a moustache, am upset to call the bride of Christ. If I am happy to call myself bride of Christ, then please you be happy to call yourself son of God. Okay? So there is no sexual discrimination in the kingdom of God. I am a bride of Christ and you are a son of God. So, when we are in this world, we are we are just visitors here. We can use the worldly things. But we are not going to be slaves of the world. We are not going to entertain the worldly lusts to overtake us. We are here temporarily. We are here to represent Jesus. And after our time we are going to go to heaven. We are not going to build kingdoms and monuments on this earth. We belong to to heaven. Mm -hmm. But the devil wants to tell us, no, you have a large part to play on this earth. You need the worldly things. So today I find many, many Christians compromising the values of God, compromising the values of the word of God just for worldly benefits. And to, to, to see that this is happening in former Christian nations appalls me. When I first came to England in 1993 when I landed at Heathrow Airport I thought I am coming to a Christian country. Mm. Coming from a Buddhist country and in a moment I will explain how I am persecuted now. But I will tell you when I came in 1993 I thought I came to a Christian country. When I went to a Bible college to study I thought I was coming into a Christian place. When I went to churches to worship the Lord and sometimes to preach, I thought I am going to Christian churches to preach. But, I saw, but what I saw appalled me. It grieved me. Because Christianity has just become a name. Yeah. It's no yeah. longer a value. It's no longer a life. It's no longer the relationship. It's no longer the representation of God through me. My dear friends, you can't do that in Sri Lanka. Because if you, if you are a compromiser, if you want to live like a nominal Christian in Sri Lanka, it's too expensive to do that. Because as Christians, I have a little daughter. She is not allowed to go to a regular school like children of other families only because she is a Christian. 
either she has to be schoolless or she has to go to a school where foreign children come and study paying heavy fees so my child is now going to school to a school where I have to pay a lot and my God is supplying miraculously the fees that I am paying but not many Christians can do that so many Christian children don't have schools in my country and many people are not given jobs because they are Christians and if you live in a village you are not allowed to take water from the village well if you are a Christian and you are not allowed to buy goods from the village grocery grocery stores if you are a Christian so to be a Christian is very expen expensive only those who are willing to suffer for God would like to do that so we see in the book of Peter in the verse that we read that the flesh needs to be suppressed and I'll tell you suffering makes the world look less attractive for the past three years I have been going through the greatest sufferings that I had experienced in my life I told you about how I was suffered in my first initial Christian uh, life as a family we were baptized on the 30th of April 1979 and the next day we lost all our wealth all our houses the Hindu relatives came and confiscated all our things and my father was put in a prison on a false allegation and for five years we suffered without food my mother would cook one curry a bean curry or something not not any meat and she would keep it for five days and we eat one loaf of bread between our family daily that's how our life was as a family we suffered then I became a pastor full-time pastor in 1986 and in those days I, I used to go and people tried to kill me because I was a pastor I had a suitcase a briefcase and in the briefcase I would fill uh, little injection boxes you know the injection medicines come in little bottles I, I fill those bottles with sand and different types of uh, leaves and stuff and I keep them to to show that I have some medicines so that I I, I, I go to bus stands and I leave the briefcase open and I shout with a handheld uh, my, uh, my speaker, loudspeaker if you have headache, if you have fever, if you have uh, stomachache, you come, I have medicine. So people think all the bottles that I have contain medicines and they come and they, they gather around me and when they come I preach the gospel. Sometimes they chase me to kill me because they were deceived. And I'll tell you, I, I used to carry the suitcase and, 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 the, and the loudspeaker and run for my life, suffering. You see, when I became the pastor, th that's another thing that I find here. People come to Bible colleges and they study and they get their degrees and immediately they are given a placement. They go to a lovely church which already has some people and boy, you know, they know to prepare sermons. Why? They know to... Uh, flip through the pages of encyclopedias, Bible dictionaries, they know the Bible geography as well, they have degrees from reputed universities and, and they now know to prepare sermons so they, they, they prepare sermons and when the Holy Spirit wants to say something they say excuse me Holy Spirit I am busy please, please wait till I come so without the help of the Holy Spirit these people prepare the sermons and for money that they get they deliver a sermon but when we started our ministry, my dear friends, people were chasing us. We were running for our lives. One day they caught me. And they brought a 13-year-old deaf and dumb girl. And they said, if you can heal headaches, if your Jesus can heal headaches and stomach aches, he sure must be able to heal this girl. If this girl doesn't speak today, you are kaput, they said. They were going to kill me. I said, Lord, what is this? Is this how my ministers should end? 
not even one month into my becoming a pastor. But I'll tell you something. I had known what the power of Jesus is. The power of Jesus is not coming on television and, and selling your anointing. Not coming on famous televisions and talking about your ministry and asking for offerings to, to, to build your earthly kingdom. It is to show the power of Jesus to people who don't know Jesus. So I said, okay. And I said, come. And I laid my hands and prayed. And the girl spoke and she heard. Seventy people received baptism on that day. And the church was started. My dear friends, suffering. But what does suffering bring? Suffering brings fruit. So, I would like to read another, another verse. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. I love this section. I love what Paul has to say about sufferings. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience. And experience hope. See, suffering brings good fruit. It matures somebody. It nurtures somebody. It makes somebody Christ-like. Why? Because Christ suffered. I would like to tell you about the suffering of Jesus. When he started the ministry, when we talk about the suffering of Jesus, we always talk about his uh, end, his, his end time suffering, crucifixion. Here is Jesus in the river Jordan being baptized by John the Baptist. Matthew chapter 3, you can read it later on. And when Jesus comes to, comes out of the water, the heaven opens. The Holy Spirit comes in the form of a dove and sits on Jesus and the Father speaks. What does he say? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus had not yet performed a single miracle. Jesus had not yet preached a single message. Jesus had barely started his ministry by receiving water baptism. Jesus did not have a single disciple so far. Jesus had not done anything in the ministry yet, but he receives the graduation certificate saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. My dear friends, for one person to be a son of God, he doesn't have to do things. He doesn't have to be a performer. It's not what you do. It's what you are. What are your values? How you are before God? What are you before God? Who are you in God? But today, it's how many people do you have in your church? If you say 500, oh, you are a great minister. If you have 50, mm, not that much. If you have 5, Oh, you're not even a minister. Friends, it's not how many do you have. It's not how much you have done. Remember Jesus said, many people would come in that time and they'll say, Jesus, we prophesied in your name. We, we performed miracles in your name. We cast demons out in your name. Don't you know us? Jesus says, I don't know you. Why? Because you had double standards. That's not what the Bible says, but I'm saying. I'm saying Jesus doesn't want people's performances. Jesus wants people with their values. What am I? That's what matters. I have seen so many people who have done so many great things, but then later on they have compromised. And I'll tell you, those who don't want to go through suffering will definitely compromise. Those who don't want to be hurt will definitely compromise. And today we are living in a world where people find the word of God offensive. 
People read the Psalms only. They don't turn to Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. They don't turn to places where the Bible points the sins. Where the Bible talks about holiness. People don't want to hear about holiness. Why? Because they have all the unnecessary evil crap in their lives. And they don't want the Bible to talk about that. And when you want to hear sermons, they want to hear Jesus loves you. Jesus heals you. Jesus cuddles you. Jesus does this to you, that, that to you. That's it. You can be whatever you want. Jesus heals you. Come on. You know, they, they, can, they can be druids. They can be Freemasons. They can be spiritists. They can be reading horoscopes from the newspapers. They can be into aromatherapy and whatnot. They can have yoga. They can, they can have Tai Chi and everything. And when they go at night, they want to read the Bible, Psalm 23, and they say, Oh, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. What is this? That's not what the Lord wants. The Lord wants real Christians. Pure, holy. What is holiness? Separated from the world and separated unto God. Just separated from the world, mystics, ascetics. But separated unto God, Christians. So Paul says, suffering brings that maturity. Three years ago, my daughter fell ill right after our return from America. And in America I was preaching and wherever I go, I, I stir the churches up. <laughs> wherever I go, I preach the word and, and, and sometimes people get offended. But I don't care. Because as long as I preach the word, that's what I want. And there were many healings, there were many good things. And here I go back to Sri Lanka and my daughter is taken ill and she is admitted in the hospital. So I was despondent, I was discouraged, I asked the Lord, why? Then I had to be in the hospital for 10 days in the car park. Uh, because the mother and the daughter were in the hospital uh, ward and I was in the car park. I was wondering why, Lord, why did you now I have come back from America, still I am suffering from jet lag, couldn't even rest. Why is this, Lord? And then I heard 100 people armed with guns, knives and chains have been mobilized to kill me when they see me. I didn't know that. So God was protecting me from those enemies in a hospital car park. And when they could not find me, they increased the number to 200 people. For two and a half years, 200 armed men were looking to kill me anywhere they see. They were trying to go to, they went to all the places that I go, to the churches that I go to preach, to the homes that I visit, even to the shops and the post office and the internet cafes and the banks that I used to go. But do you know what happened? A God had put somebody, a secret believer of his, in one of the top places. And that person would call me from the public phone and tell, he, he used to tell me, Suresh, don't stay there, killers are coming, run. So for two and a half years, I have been on the run. There were times when they decided to throw bombs to the homes that I went, to the churches that I went, because they couldn't find me. They would just destroy these places so many people would die. So at that, at that time, I just came out of Sri Lanka. I came to United Kingdom. I went to America. I have gone through tremendous suffering. And because they couldn't kill me, they fabricated a story that I destroyed the Buddhist statues and and they arrested me and, and there was a big case going on and I have spent about in, in, in English money I have spent about three uh, thirty three thousand uh, pounds 20,000 I mean 20,000 pounds for the case and we 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 live by faith we, we are not funded by any foreign organization and when I go you know, even the people who feel like giving an offering don't give me offering because most of my messages are offensive. 
they think Suresh will come and you know give a sermon Jesus loves you and everything I tell them I you all know Jesus loves you Jesus heals you but let's talk about holiness let's talk about the word of God I preach what the Bible says and I'm black and white and I hate what my Lord hates and I love my what my Lord loves that's it full stop I don't care whether people give me money or not and and even even last January we went to America and and uh, we spent way more than what the offerings gave us but I come back happy satisfied because I have done God's ministry and that alone is a suffering in its own rights so so financial suffering and and there were times when our students did not have anything to eat and on on several occasions our, I heard later on that my students even ate snakes <laughs> and they even ate a rat so uh, you see there are stories when when, when we uh, did not have anything to eat and, and things like that. But I'll tell you something, suffering brings maturity. That is why my students who have gone through suffering, they mature. They mature long before they mature in their age. And shall I tell you something which will surprise you? I was the senior pastor of three churches when I was 18. I preached my first sermon at a communion service when I was 13 and God used to be why because I went through suffering I, I can I, I can preach a whole message about suffering but I'm going to wrap it up now my final verdict of my court case is tomorrow in Sri Lanka 15th of July 2010 is going to be tomorrow but I'll tell you even now, physically, I am suffering. You may see a very happy Suresh. Yes, I am happy. I One of the messages that I preach all over is, Rejoice in the Lord always. And I say again, rejoice. The devil wants to remove the joy from our lives. No matter what, be happy. There are, there are thousand and one reasons for us to be sad and despondent. But there is only one reason to be happy. Jesus. Salvation. Salvation is there. We can lose anything. I can lose my life. But when people told me, run away from Sri Lanka. Come to America. Come to Switzerland. Be here. Why are you wanting to stay there? I say, my Lord has not yet told me to get out of Sri Lanka. So I stay back. And one day the, 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 the lawyer calls me. All the lawyers were threatened. All the lawyers were threatened. Now I want to share this not to say what sort of a man I am. I am nothing. But the Lord in me has strengthened me. One day my lawyer calls me and says, Suresh, do you know what they are doing? They have so fabricated the case that tomorrow at 9 o'clock they are going to take you in for 30 years. And they will not disclose in which prison are you held. And they are going to keep you in a way that you can't meet anybody from the outside world. And the outside world will not be disclosed of your whereabouts and what has happened to you. Then I said, what am I supposed to do? He said, take your wife and your daughter. Fly out of Sri Lanka tonight. Because they are going to get you tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock in the court. I said, why? I mean, to cut a very big story short. Only a certain document from the Ministry of Archaeology, the Department of Archaeology rather, signed by the director, could prevent my, uh, my imprisonment of 30 years. And that lawyer said, Suresh, you know only too well how Sri Lanka works. The document will never come, so you better fly. I was so upset, you know what I did as a man? I, I, I went to the lake and I tried to jump and commit suicide. Yes, I have two PhDs, I am a psychologist and I am a pastor and everything. But my friends, when you are alone, when you are so pressed, when you don't know where to turn, you become that lonely human being who cannot do anything. There are the times when the devil wants to really have it on you. When I went to the lake, I saw my face in that water. I saw the reflection. 
and I saw an apostle there. When I saw my face in that water, I saw God's ordained apostle. Mm. I didn't see myself, I saw God's servant. Mm. And I felt so ashamed of myself. I said, thank you Lord, and I prayed in tongues for one hour. Mm. I went back to the lawyer and, say, and I said, no, I don't care. Even if I go to the prison, I will change that prison into a church. I, I am staying, I am not running away from the problems. And he said, you are the most foolish client I have ever had. I said, it's okay. Friends, the Bible says, God chooses the foolish things of the world to <laughs> confound the wisdom of uh, the world. The right? Rise. Praise God. I am willing to be a fool for Jesus. So, the next morning I went to the court and I was seated, but, 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 but on that night, I'll tell you, I was again a human, right? I told my wife, let's visit all our relatives. She didn't know what was going on. But I knew that I was going to see these people for the last time. Because in 30 years, when I, if I'm alive and if they release me after 30 years, many of these people will be dead and gone. And many of these small children would have become big people. Even my daughter must, she would have grown and she would have had her own children. So I was containing myself. And I went to every one of our relatives' homes with my wife. And people thought that I'm nervous because of the next day's case. But I knew that I was definitely going in for 30 years. And I was very sad. So I would go to a home, I look at those people's faces, then I would run to their toilet, cry, and then I wash my face and come out. And finally when we came to my wife's sister's place, and we were, we were there, uh, a niece of mine, she looked at me and said, Uncle, you are very disturbed, aren't you? I said, yes. She said, you're just like me. I said, how? You must listen to this. See how God blesses you. This girl who was, a, who was about uh, 17, 18 years old at that time. She was wearing a beautiful blue dress when I came from America. And when I saw her, I said, oh, you're so beautiful. And I took pictures. She went and asked her mother, is this true? that Uncle Suresh is telling me that I am beautiful on this dress. Her mother, who is actually my wife's sister, told her, if Uncle Suresh says so, it must be true, because he doesn't lie. So this girl believed me, and she continued to wear this dress for two more hours, because initially she had thought that this dress is not beautiful. So she tells me, Uncle, you are just like me. I asked why. Then she said, Uncle, when you told me that I am beautiful in that dress, I didn't believe it, but I believed it because you said so. Then I said, okay, what, what are you trying to tell me? She said, Uncle, you think you can't handle this crisis, whatever it is, but God permitted you to go through this because for God, you are the only person in Sri Lanka who can go through this. Can you see that? An 18 year old girl, not a PhD scholar, not a big theologian, not a very world famous man of God, but a little child spoke to me and I got that guts and the gusto. And the next morning I went to the court, ready to prepare to go to the prison. Even if that happens, I will change that prison to a church. And when I was called, I got up to go and take my defendant's stand when a man walked into the court and handed over that letter to my lawyer. The letter which was not expected to come came miraculously and they could not arrest me for 30 years. Praise the Lord. And, and that emotional suffering, the physical suffering and, and all that suffering has brought in maturity. Now, now what am I? I am down physically. Even tomorrow I am having some 
medical checkups here in Leighton Hospital. You are you are looking at a happy Suresh. I am really happy, but my my body has been wasted over the past many years. I am a wasted. My brain is wasted. My heart is wasted. I don't know how long I will live, but I don't care because my life begins when I leave this earth. So what I am trying to say is this, friends. I think I will have to talk again on suffering because I am far from my preparation. But I think the story of this man who has gone through suffering from the from day one of of his Christian life will bless you. Christianity is a wonderful thing, but it has suffering, and that suffering, just as Paul said in Romans five, will bring us to maturity. Prepare. To suffer for Christianity, it doesn't matter what befalls you, who leaves you, what things you forfeit for Jesus. Stand for Jesus, because He is the best. The Word of God is the best, and stand for the best. Suffer for God. May God bless you.